This is wide receiver Jeremy Curley of the New York Jets, and you're listening to the Shorts Sports Show. Welcome, everybody, to the Short Sports Show. I'm your host, Daniel Short. Today is Monday, October 26, 2015. How's everybody doing? We're so close to Halloween. So very close. Uh, anyways, we got a jam-packed show for you guys. A lot of news in college football, a lot of news in the NFL, a lot of things to recap and get on with. And uh, I, I'm just, I'm excited. I am excited for this. Uh, sorry, I have to apologize, first of all, uh, about Friday's show. Uh, the rain here in Central Texas it wasn't really too much of the rain. It was more of lightning around the area. We had a few uh, lightning strikes around here that was just not safe uh, <laughs> to, to, uh, to, to have the show. But nonetheless, we are here and uh, it doesn't matter because usually I do my picks and 90% of the time my picks go wrong. Actually, I did pretty well last week. I got some good picks. Uh, I picked USC to win, uh, which it means absolutely nothing now because people are going to think I'm just making that up. But I picked US- USC. Uh, I threw the paper away. Oh, here it is. Here it is. I picked UCLA. And for people to think that I'm just lying about USC and UCLA picked, I picked Miami to beat Clemson. I'm being 100% honest. I picked Miami to beat Clemson as the upset. And uh, that's why I'm retiring from the show. No. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I don't make the best of picks. Uh, That wasn't even a competitive game at all. And thankfully, it it was bittersweet. It was a bittersweet game. Uh, Obviously, losing 58 to nothing is never any good. But when it allows... Or forces, I should say, your athletic director to then fire the coach you wanted to be fired so long ago. It, it, it's That's what makes it sweet. That's what makes it sweet right there. So glad Al Golden is out of Miami. <sighs> the happiest thing I heard all day Saturday. It, oh, actually Sunday, excuse me. Uh, well, it was a mix. It was like Saturday night, Sunday. Anyways, doesn't matter. I was happy. I think everybody else in Miami was celebrating knowing that Al Golden was fired. I think they were celebrating more that he was fired than even if we had won the game. That's that's how big it was. Um, so that that was the great news. That was the great news. Another great news is that uh, my computer. So as you guys might have known, actually you probably did it, uh, I had to send my computer back after I just got it back. This is now the third time or fourth. I can't remember now. I've sent my computer back. Uh, thankfully, it looks like they're going to junk it. It looks like they're going to finally junk it out. Give me store credit. I could go buy a brand new computer, uh, an actual working one. I've been without my desktop for about two and a half months now, so uh, it's very frustrating. But thankfully, it's about to get taken care of, and we're going to be able to do the things I've been wanting to do since, uh, what, three months ago. <laughs> so uh, I'm excited for that, guys. Thank you for bearing with me there. And uh, before we start the show, be sure to follow me on Twitter, at short underscore sports 24-7. Be sure to follow me and, or excuse me, like my page on Facebook, The Short Sports Show. And uh, let's go ahead and get on with this show. Uh, We'll go through some college football news first. We'll talk about the NFL, talk about some World Series stuff. And I know I put in my description like two shows ago or three shows ago, and I didn't even talk about it. Sorry, slipped my mind. We'll talk about the World Series and also talk about the NBA season starting up and talking about my fantasy draft for NBA. I think I did good. I think I did good. Actually, I, I I think I did very well. First, Arkansas head coach Brent Bielma says running back Raleen Williams had successful neck surgery following the Razorbacks' four-overtime win o- uh, over Auburn on Saturday. What a game that was. Uh, Williams was injured during a run in the third quarter of the 54-46 win, after which he was taken from the field on a stretcher. He had his face mask grabbed by another player. Uh, before getting hit afterwards uh, by another Auburn player. Bielma said Williams is is expected to make a full recovery, but that no timetable has been set for his return uh, to football. This year, as a true freshman, uh, he's rushed for 254 yards and a rushing touchdown this year, averaging four and a half carries, uh, excuse me, four and a half yards per carry. I'm getting everything mixed right now. Haven't done the show in a while. Uh, 
bad news for them, but really good that he's going to be able to be uh, come back because this guy, what Arkansas can do to recruit running backs, I, it's unbelievable. Uh, USC Trojans, even though after they got a huge victory over number former number three Utah, they lost another offensive lineman. This time, Toa Lobenda, uh, who will miss the rest of the year with a torn ACL. The injury occurred in the first half of the game. He started the season at right guard, but switched to center during the Trojans' loss to Washington when Max Turek also suffered a torn ACL. Now with both of them out, USC will turn to sophomore Khalil Rodgers at center. Rodgers started three games at left guard in 2014. Also, freshman safety Marvell Tell uh, will be out at least six weeks with a broken clavicle. USC, who is four and three and two and two in the Pac-12, plays at Cal, who is five and two and two and two in conference uh, on Saturday. So, if USC can win that game, they're not out of it just yet. USC is not out of it just yet. As shocking as that might sound. They are not out of it yet. The Pac-12 is one of the weirdest conferences right now. Uh, I mean, you got Washington State, who I think is like number one in the North, in the Pac-12 North. I think they're number one. I mean, when's the first? When's the last time we ever said that? Is this the first time we've ever said that? That Washington State, the Cougars, Wazoo, is number one in the Pac-12 North right now. Midway through the year. It's not after week one I'm saying that. I'm saying this in week eight, week seven, whatever week we're in. About to go week nine, whatever. It's it's crazy. It's crazy to say think that and say it. Uh, George O'Leary has retired as UCF's football coach effective immediately. In a statement released by the school, O'Leary said the he, uh, plan uh, was for him to retire after this season. And, in fact, he wanted to retire two seasons ago, saying, quote, after the 2013 championship season and the Fiesta Bowl win, I expressed my intention to retire at that time. After significant discussion with the UCF administration, I reconsidered and agreed to coach two additional seasons in 2014 to 2015. The administration has always been aware of my plan to retire after this season. In, effort to, in an effort to allow UCF to accelerate its search for my successor and clarify the facts regarding my future plans, I am retiring Effective immediately, O'Leary said. O'Leary's been at the school. Uh, he's been a UCF football coach since 2004 uh, and was named at school's interim athletic director last June uh, after Todd Stansbury accepted the job at Oregon State. Quarterbacks coach Danny Barrett will serve as the interim head coach uh, for the rest of the year. However, UCF president John Hitt uh, said the university expre- expects to hire a permanent replacement from outside the program, which which would, would be good. Um, a whole staff has been there, obviously, for a while. And Georgia Leary has done a great job. I mean, recruiting for UCF is already tough because you got the big three major schools in Miami, Florida State, and Florida. So having to recruit between all of those and, and getting outside recruits is already tough enough for them. Having the great year they had in 2013 was, you know, phenomenal. But they've hit back to life. They're back to UCF that we know. Maybe not as bad as being an 0 and 8, but you know UCF. It's tough there, and George O'Leary still did a great job. Um, the school obviously still searching for a new vice president and athletic director. Hopes to complete the search by December, um, and again they will find a replacement outside the program. At 0 and 8, the Knights are one of four winless teams in the FBS. As UCF lost fifty nine to ten at home to number twenty one Houston, they had they had a good first half and then it just switched real quick. Um, UCF is also ranked last in the nation in total offense. And obviously, the best news of Saturday was Miami, who had fired their head coach Al Golden at one day after the biggest loss in school history. Hurricanes athletic director Blake James made the announcement Sunday evening. Titans coach and run game coordinator Larry Scott will serve as an interim head coach, which is pretty funny because you look at the Miami Dolphins, what they did after they fired Joe Philbin, they gave it to the tight end coach. They're now 2-0 and with him and dominated both games. And now you, you're doing it for Miami Hurricanes. That'd be kind of funny if they, they go on a little winning streak. Uh, this is what athletic director Blake James said, quote, uh, excuse me, quote, Coach Golden has 
led our program through some difficult times. However, we have a proud tradition of excellence at Miami, not just in football, but in all sports. And we want to compete for an ACC and national championships. I simply believe that now is the time to bring the Hurricane family together and rally behind our young men. Golden was 32 and uh, 25 and 17 and 18 in ACC in his four plus seasons in Coral Gables. But after a 58 to nothing home loss Saturday to undefeated Clemson, proved to be the end of his tenure. Again, so happy, so, so happy, guys. Miami is just four and three on the year. Uh, after one year going six and seven, despite having seven players that were eventually selected in the 2015 NFL draft, I mean that's just ridiculous. Uh, Golden also was 0 and five against rivals Florida State, and the only Canes coach since 1979 to go winless against the in-state rival during his tenure. Uh, Golden also posted a three and eleven mark against teams that are, were in the AP top 25. And was 0-2 in bowl games. And now, this whole season, and I felt like even last season, fans have been flying banners attached to planes above Miami games throughout the season, imploring Miami to fire Al Golden. For, former Hurricane plans were regularly vocal about their disapproval of Golden. And on Sunday, many former players celebrated Golden's dismissal. Philip Buchanan tweeted, quote, Merry Christmas. Warren Sapp tweeted a picture of him on a bicycle using hashtag Al Gone. Billy Corbin, the director of the, th the two 30 for 30 documentaries on Miami, wrote several tweets about Golden's firing offered it, and offered his own uh, PR advice uh, to the Miami Hurricanes brass. It also began with Butch Davis coming back. This is what he said, quote, pro PR move, hire Butch, stack assistance with Kane Legends, Groom one as a successor, Butch retires as director of football ops, count cash. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't say I disagree. Um, but F Philip Buchanan was also saying that don't worry. He was telling the recruits don't worry that a lot of the alumni, former players are going to come back and really be around and help pick a coach or at least try. Uh, but whenever a new head coach is there, they're going to be there a lot more in helping these other players get motivated, bring the swagger back to Miami, back to being the U, and hopefully just a whole lot better. Because ever since Al Golden took over, it's just his, his stupid opening line is what frustrates me. It's what I never liked before. Before he even coached at Miami, when he was asked, why Miami, why now? And then he just gave this ugly, stupid little look and said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And he just kept repeating. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I sound salty, but, man, that was so annoying to hear and look at when he said it. And then you get this huge crowd clapping for him. Right then and there, I just knew. I was like, man, Miami screwed up. <laughs> Randy Shannon, I still believed in him when he was there. And, uh, yeah, it, that that's just disappointing. It really is. Uh, sadly, Saturday was not all fun. A woman faces second-degree murder charges after authorities said that she plowed her car into the crowd at an Oklahoma State University homecoming parade, killing four people, including a toddler. Adesia Chambers, a 25-year-old resident of Stillwater, uh, was arrested after sa Saturday's crash uh, on driving while under the influence charge, and Stillwater police said Sunday she is being held on four additional counts of second-degree murder uh tony coleman chambers attorney said that his client may suffer from mental illness uh he also said she didn't he did she did not smell of alcohol uh when he met her hours after the crash police are waiting blood tests to determine if she was impaired by drugs or alcohol coleman said this in a press conference in oklahoma city quote i absolutely can rule out alcohol uh he was adding that he spoke, had spoken to her aunt, grandmother, and boyfriend, and all said she was not drinking. He added that his what uh, it was his opinion that she suffers from mental illness and that she was had warning signs of behavior before the crash, including the inability to sleep. "Quote: She doesn't remember a whole lot about what happened. Uh, there was a period where I think she could have been even blacked out." It's, I don't know. <laughs> that This is where it gets ridiculous and uh, stuff like that. 
Chambers all, also only recalls people uh, removing her from the car and being extremely confused. If this case ends up, and this is just strictly my opinion only, and uh, if I catch heat for it, I, then that's what happens. I absolutely 100% hate the fact that you can just say she suffers from a mental illness from a stupid, stupid mistake that she made. Uh, I mean, there had to be... Some, well, we'll find out if something was involved, whether blood, or during the blood test, whether it was drugs or alcohol. Um, but to be using the mental illness thing and then to get away with some of these counts that she will possibly or will potentially have on her to use the mental illness. I, I absolutely hate that thing to say when someone kills somebody and they say they were just mentally unstable or unfit, whatever it may be to get them out of, you know, for that to be an excuse for them to get out of what happened is absolutely ridiculous. I hate it. It's stupid. And, uh, you know, I don't wish bad on anybody, but I definitely believe justice has to be served with this. And I don't want to see a mental health facility. I, I, that would be very disappointing. Um, but again, that's, that's just, that's all on me. That's all my opinion. Three adults and two and a two year old boy who wasn't immediately identified were killed and at least 46 others were hurt, including at least four critically injured. Hospitals initially said five were critically injured, but one of those was upgraded to fair condition, thankfully, on Sunday. <clears throat> the dead adults were identified as Nakita Nakal, who's 23 and an MBA student from India at the University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond, and a married couple, Bonnie Jean Stone and Marvin Lyle Stone, both 65 of Stillwater, Marvin Stone was a retired professor of agriculture engineering who has been popular with the students, a colleague said. Among the injured were nine children, 10 years old or younger. Uh, real quick, guys, I just want to have a moment of silence for them. Okay, thoughts and prayers go out uh, to those affected, those families, uh, to get over that. It, it, it's, it's, I don't know what it's like. I won't say it will. That's absolutely, uh, you know, a tough thing to go through. Um, but it's, you know, for this Tony Coleman guy to go out there and just say it's mental illness and stuff like that, I find it ridiculous. I really do. Um, but I guess when you're getting paid to, you know, <laughs> For that then that's what you got to do got to see what you got to say uh the top 25 came out a little bit of changes actually a lot last week we had number three utah and now utah is now at number 13 ohio state remains at number one and this is what's shocking to me last week they had i, I believe like 28 first place votes after dominating rutgers they get now 39 do we not remember who rutgers is like, what made you change just because they had a big game against a weak team, a team they were supposed to dominate, they were supposed to play like this, and now you're giving them votes? I wait on that until they play Michigan, Michigan State, and Big Ten, impossible Big Ten championship. Let, let's wait until then to give them first place votes. Not being salty against uh, Ohio State, but what is one week against a dominant or against a weak, weak team in Rutgers? Give you say, oh, yeah, Ohio State, they're back. They're number one. JT Barrett was the right quarterback all along. It was Rutgers. I mean, <laughs> what else? But we'll see. Baylor stays shockingly at number two, even after Seth Russell fractures a bone in his neck and his timetable of recovery or, and, and to return to the football field is uncertain right now. Baylor's still number two. Uh, Clemson is number three now, making a huge jump. With six place votes. Baylor has seven place votes, first place votes. Uh, number four is LSU with number five or with five place votes. Uh, and TCU drops to number five with three first place votes. Michigan State six, Alabama seven with one first place vote. 
Stanford at eight, Notre Dame nine, and number ten is Iowa. Eleven through fifteen goes Florida, Oklahoma State, Utah, Oklahoma, and Michigan at fifteen. Sixteen through twenty is Memphis, Florida State, Houston. I love it at eighteen. I think they should be a little bit higher now. Number nineteen, Ole Miss. Twenty, Toledo. Twenty-one through twenty-five is Temple, Duke. Pittsburgh, UCLA, and Mississippi State. And this week, we have a stable of games. Again, we'll talk about those on Friday's show, but just check this out real quick. We got really good games. Obviously, TCU, West Virginia, uh, Thursday night. I'm excited for that game. Obviously, going with my TCU Frogs. But look at the games that we got. We have Ole Miss at Auburn. That You never know. You never know. Auburn could just pull that surprise on Ole Miss. It doesn't really matter now, but they might. Uh, you have Florida at Georgia. Never know. Clemson at North Carolina State. You never know. Uh, Oklahoma State at Texas Tech. That might be a trap game for Oklahoma State. Maryland at... Uh, no, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> Michigan at Minnesota. Going to be a solid game. Uh, let's see. Vanderbilt at Houston. Houston could be the SEC team. Granted, it's uh, Vanderbilt, but still, you never know. And uh, Notre Dame at Temple, Washington State hosting Stanford. I mean, we got a stable of games next week, and uh, they're going to be really good. going to be some good games out there. But let's go ahead and recap some games from Saturday. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, yeah. Memphis and Tulsa, which happened on Friday night, had the most combined points in a college football game this season with 108 as the final score was 66-42. to 42. And uh, ESPN put a little thing on their ticker on the bottom line. Said, again, it was the most points. I was like, just wait until TCU and Baylor go at it. Whether Seth Seth Russell is there or not, that game will break all sorts of records (laughs) again. And uh, will most likely have the most points in college football probably all time. Well, well, I don't know. There's like, what, 140 to nothing that Georgia Tech put on some – team back in like 30s or 40s so maybe not that game but y'all know what i mean in the modern century gonna be the most high high scoring game pittsburgh escapes syracuse in the carrier dome 23 to 20 syracuse you almost had it uh clemson again dominating miami 58 to nothing brad kyer goes out with a concussion iowa state almost had it with baylor if iowa state had an offense this might have been different or if baylor was playing Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, this might have been a different game for Baylor. They might have lost this game. 45-27, and here I go. I'm going to go on my little TCU rant real quick. (sighs) Here we go. Sorry, guys. TCU goes on the road, national television, at night in Ames, Iowa, with 63 crazy fans cheering for Iowa State. We beat Iowa State. TCU beats Iowa State. 45-21. They shut Iowa State down from the second through the fourth quarter. Iowa State's 21 points came in the first. And TCU dominates the second half of the game. Baylor is held scoreless in, what, the third quarter. And, And that was still with Seth Russell. And also, they lose. They, they, Baylor ends up winning 45-27 at home. Multiple missed opportunities for them. Iowa State was putting this into a game. Could have made it closer. But yet, ESPN people and other, as quote, analysts said that Baylor handles business at home, but TCU squeaks by. I don't understand how that is. is. Is the fix already in play? Does it matter if TCU plays this season? That That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. Because you're going to start looking at common opponents now. Is it now that play, uh, Baylor's playing some real teams. Yeah, they dominated Tech and we didn't. So they, they give you the, give them that one. Granted, we, again, we're on the road in Lubbock, which is completely different than a, a you know, half-filled Jerry Jones Stadium. But still... They dominated them. I'll give them that. that, 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 That's what it gives. But how did they get the Iowa State game? How did they, quote, play better than TCU? How did they not squeak by? That's my rant. Houston dominates UCF 59-10. Toledo 
comes back and stays undefeated. 51-35 to UMass. Tennessee couldn't get the job done. I, Tennessee, I needed y'all to win. I needed y'all to win so we could drop Alabama and they don't have some late surge into the playoffs, which is probably is what's going to happen. 19-14, to Alabama comes back with Derrick Henry's touchdown. Duke defeats Virginia Tech in another four-overtime game, 45-43. I think that's the first time, at least from what I can recall, that we had two games in a single week go four overtimes. That's incredible. Texas Tech gets dominated by Oklahoma 63 to 27. Kansas loses to Oklahoma State 58 to 10. Michigan State kept it close with Indiana in the first somewhat half into the third quarter and then pulled away 52 to 26. Uh LSU handles business against a very good Western Kentucky uh team in the crazy rain weather 48 to 20. Ole Miss handles Texas A&M 23 to 3. And it seems like Texas A&M is that first half team. They'll start off 5 and 0 and then they just collapse after they play real teams. I don't I don't know what happens to A&M after 5 games. They just they suck. Uh Georgia Tech incredible and thank you so much for doing it. They blocked a field goal that would have possibly won the game for Florida State. Block it, take it all the way back for a touchdown. It's okay. Michigan knows how uh, how Florida State fans feel. It's okay. Uh, USC dominates Utah 42-24. to Ohio State dominates Rutgers 49-7. to And Stanford gets the victory 31-14 to over the UW Huskies without their starting quarterback. I just want that. I just want to point that out. They didn't have their starting quarterback. So just saying. Uh, but yeah, it, it's going to be exciting week nine i guess we're in week nine for college football uh i'm excited it, it just it's gonna start getting better november rolls in and it's where a lot of it's gonna be crazy also november 3rd next tuesday not tomorrow but next tuesday is when the college football committee makes their top 25 and that is what everybody will start going by the ap poll the coach poll no longer matters or any other poll that's out there no longer matters except for the college football playoff poll, um, again, which takes over November 3rd. And you can watch it on ESPN, I believe, at 6.30 Central Time, 7.30 Central Time, somewhere around there. Um, check your local listings, I should say. Back to the NFL. We got some NFL news. Johnny Manziel might start at quarterback for the Cleveland Browns next Sunday's game against Arizona. But he also has an interview scheduled in part – Uh, of the NFL's investigation into the accident in which he was involved in October 12th in Avon, uh, Ohio. The exact date and location of the interview are not known. A source familiar with the situation said Manziel is scheduled to talk to the league two weeks or more after he was questioned by Avon police uh, following domestic argument with his girlfriend, who I believe is a TCU alum, or at least is going to TCU, uh, in his car. Manziel did not acknowledge that the uh, an interview was scheduled, but he said he would cooperate if asked. Quote, if anybody reaches out to me, if the NFL does reach out to me, I will fully cooper- cooperate Excuse me, with anything they ask me. Anything they need from me, I'm not shying away from that. I fully, I, excuse me, I cooperated fully with Avon. I cooperated fully with everybody in the Browns and anybody that's asking me anything. It's an ongoing situation, and I really don't want to speak on it much more than that. If a situation does arise, I will fully cooperate. That's really it. I don't know how many times you can say cooperate <laughs> in, a, in a statement. It's, it's crazy. Manziel went 4 of 5 for 27 yards and had one carry for 5 yards in his appearance Sunday. Uh, marked his first game action since he started in a victory over Tennessee in the second game of the season. Manziel could start next week because Josh McCown left uh, the loss to the Rams with 5 minutes and 17 seconds left with the right shoulder injury in his uh, game time decision slash doubtful uh, for the Arizona game, which it, I'm happy Manziel is most likely going to start in, in an NFL game again get another chance. The sad part and the bad part, not only does he have this distraction going on, he now has to play the Arizona Cardinals, which we can watch tonight on ESPN on Monday Night Football, hosting the Baltimore Ravens on 7.30 Central Time. <laughs> we'll talk about that game in just a minute. But he's got to play the Cardinals. 
Uh, I don't know if it's home. I hope it's home, but honestly, I don't even know if it's going to matter. The Cardinals' defense is really good, and we'll watch it again tonight. And Manziel, well, Manziel's good. Brown's offense, a little iffy here. So I don't know how excited I am to see him play against the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, New York Giants defensive end Jason Pierre-Paul plans to be in New Jersey on Tuesday to meet the team doctors and officials and have his right hand examined by the Giants for the first time since September 7th. Pierre-Paul planned to fly in last week to meet with the Giants, but since the early part of the team's week was compressed due to last week's Monday Night Football game in Philadelphia, the meeting was rescheduled for this week. And assuming it doesn't get pushed back again, which is still possible, believe it or not, uh, it will be the second time the Giants will have had a chance to examine Pierre's Paul hand uh, since the July 4th fireworks accident that cost him again his right index finger. Uh, when he was in town on September 7th, the, he told the team he wanted to find some way to protect the hand and play right away, but they said it, they decided it, he was not ready. So, whoops, that was a phone call. Um, sources say Pierre Paul plants. He could be play right away if the team would agree to let him, but the Giants are likely to be more cautious, and there's a chance he won't. Uh, they won't clear him to play at all this season, which is most likely because I believe if he if he doesn't play this year, they don't have to pay him or pay him a, a ton of money. Makes it a lot of sense that they kind of just say, eh, you know what, we're just gonna gonna let it slide right now and and not have you play. But it's going to be interesting to see following this week to see what happens with Pierre Paul and if and when he will be able to play. A guy that won't be playing in this season anymore and not really, it doesn't come to a shocker. Texans running back Arian Foster suffered a torn Achilles tendon during the fourth quarter of Houston Texans 44 to 26 loss to Miami uh, to the Dolphins uh, per sources. He will undergo a MRI exam today, but Again, he's out for the season. Uh, Foster was on crutches in the locker room after the game. He sat uh, at his locker for a while, put a towel over his head, and dropped uh, his head into his hands for a few seconds. And when asked how, if he knows how serious the injury is, he said, quote, not yet, but it's not good. Uh, Texans head coach Bill O'Brien said, quote, I feel terrible for him. He's done a lot for us in two years. I've been here. I hate that part of the game, end quote. The injury... It happened less than five minutes remaining in the game when the Texans were trailing 44 to 20. Foster motioned out wide and went down as soon as he began his route, and he was not even touched on the play. Foster said, quote, it's just a routine play, trying to make a cut, and he gave out on me. He missed the first three games of the season with a groin injury he suffered during minicamp, then had surgery to reattach the muscle to the bone on August 7th. Returned August 4th against the Falcons, a game the Texans lost 48-21. to And since 2011, Foster has missed at least one game due to injury all but one season. And I said a few shows ago, the Texans should just trade Foster. Get what you can right now before he gets hurt again. Go back. I, I believe it was after the Atlanta Falcons game. Uh, it, it had to be a Friday show then. Go, you know, go listen to that. Or actually, no, because it might have been a Sunday. So find that episode after the Atlanta Falcons game, and I said that they need to trade him, so that they can get fourth, fifth, sixth at worst round pick, get something in return, play for the future. Because obviously, you suck. The Texans suck this season given back-to-back -back or huge big losses already this year. I mean, it's time to move on. And again, look, now he got hurt, and you can't trade him. You got to just release him, cut him, and pray that you don't have to pay him a ton of money because you did not trade him. He should have been traded. Just saying. Dallas Cowboys defensive end Greg Hardy and injured receiver Des Bryant, who was not dressed for the game, appeared to get in a heated verbal exchange on the sideline during Sunday's 27-20 loss to the Giants. Hardy's intense discussion with Bryant followed immediately after he broke into the special team's huddle to yell at his teammates after they gave up a huge 100-yard return by former Dallas Cowboys wide receiver and New York Giants receiver Dwayne Harris. Later, 
late that night. It, it was then posted up everywhere and started going viral. NBC television footage later aired showing Hardy confronting a coach. Uh, Pro Football Talk identified as special teams coordinator and getting into a huge angry shouting match with him. And, and then Greg Hardy swiping at a clipboard that the special teams coordinator was holding. ESPN's Just, uh, Justina Anderson caught up with Brian and, at MetLife Stadium in the tunnel after the game and asked what happened during the, ex- you know, the exchange with Hardy. Saying, and Brian said, quote, there is no issue. That's just football. People make what uh, one makes nothing into something, especially when we lose. That's just football. Hardy, when he was asked about the game after the game, issued half a dozen, quote, no comments to questions in the locker room, then turned his back to the media. Head coach Jason Garrett said the incident was not an issue and that he thought Hardy was attempting to encourage the special teams unit. However, the the actions from those in the huddle would seem to indicate otherwise. Regardless, Garrett was not concerned about the incident. (sighs) I said, you know what? Greg Hardy, do your thing. Just focus on playing football. Let everybody talk about your past. Let everybody talk about whatever they want to. Just play football. Dominate and do what you got to do to you know, be a, a, a defensive dominance. He has done anything and everything but that. Uh, while he has created some havoc towards opposing offenses, he continues to have some type of drama with him, whether he's saying guns blazing, talking about Tom Brady's wife, now getting in, in, in the stupid word exchange with Des Bryant, and then you go and do that to a coach and swipe the clipboard. Greg Hardy, now there you got to think there are serious issues with him. There are serious mental issues with this guy. And I know for, for people look, hearing this from me and I was like, oh, so having guns on the table and threatening your girlfriend, wife, whatever, uh, that's not signs of mental illness. No, it is. It is. Um, but... <laughs> This is just ridiculous now, and now you've really got to question him. And while everybody's on Johnny Manziel and and talking about him and saying whatever about him, look at Greg freaking Hardy right now. There's multiple incidents within a less than a four week time span. It's 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 just ridiculous. Greg Hardy, I gave hope to you. I really did, and you've crushed every single ounce of it. You are ridiculous. I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and recap some games. Uh, the Raiders, wow. Chargers, really? Uh, I've given up on my Chargers this year. I'm kind of done with them. I knew this. I didn't think it was going to be this bad, but I've, I've, I've given up on the Chargers this year. We just suck. No offensive line. Um, Raiders won. One, that's already a shock. Again, But the Raiders won 37-29. to Ladies and gentlemen, it was 37-6 to in the third quarter. The last couple touchdowns, that was just, you know, freaking giving up just whatever. Amari Cooper, five receptions, 133 yards, and a touchdown. Great game for him and great for my fantasy. Uh, the Cowboys lose to the Giants 27-20 to despite Matt Castle throwing three interceptions, one a pick six. I mean, you got to think about this. Cowboys fans, you got to keep hope alive. Yes, you're two and four right now, but think of this. You are with really like a third string type quarterback in Brandon Weedy and Matt Castle. You're running back, you got a running back by committee. Randall gets hurt. McFadden is off and on. This week he did great, but you never know. He could, next week he might only have like eight rushing yards. Christian Michael really didn't do anything. Defense is up and down. You're keeping all these games close, given all of that. Imagine what's going to happen when Romo comes back healthy. Dez is back healthy. I mean, basically you now then have an offense and all, all-star, all-pro players. I uh, Cowboys, I'd still watch out. I'm not ruling them out to win the NFC East. I know they're in a hole, losing to the Giants now. Uh, you know, they, they split the division series. But I, I, I don't count them out. I would not count the Cowboys out 100% at all. I know they've lost four straight games, but 
given everything they've gone through, I don't count them out. I wouldn't. Uh, Bills lose to the Jaguars after coming back and then letting the game slip 34-31. The Buccaneers had a 24-0 lead over the Redskins on the road and then give it up. Final score, 31-30. Redskins get the victory. And actually, I remembered I said I wasn't going to say that word anymore, and I still did. Excuse me. The Washington team beat the Red, uh, the Buccaneers. I almost said it again. Holy crap. Falcons win an ugly game against the Titans, 10-7. Saints hold on, had a huge lead over them. I think it was 27 to nothing as well. And then Colts storm back to make it 21-27. But Saints end up getting a victory. Vikings hold off the Lions, 28-19. Chiefs beat the Steelers. Steelers, what are you doing? 23-13. Browns lose to the Rams 24 to 6. Dolphins beat the Texans 44 to 26. This game was not even close. It was 41 to nothing at at halftime. 41 to nothing. It was absolutely incredible. Jarvis Landry went off, Lamar Miller went off. Crazy game for the Dolphins. They're now 2 and 0. I would keep Dave Campbell, Dan Campbell, whatever his name is. I keep him. I keep him as head coach right now. Uh, it, well, depending on how he finishes the year. But right now, he's made a strong case. Uh, the Jets can't hold off the Patriots. Final score, 30-23. to Patriots now 6-0. and As well as the Panthers as they beat the Eagles, 27-16. to Man, five teams are 6-0. and Green Bay and Denver take on each other next week. So that's going to be an interesting, interesting game tomorrow night tuesday night october 27th we have the mets and the royals game one of the world series on fox at 707 p.m central time going to be a great game uh i who am i going for i'm gonna get my picks right now i say mets win it four two that's the series win right there. That, not the not the game score four two. I'm saying the series score four two. I think the Mets win it. Their offense is incredible. Yoenis is Cespedes, one of my favorite players when he was with the A's. I still like him now. He's with the Mets. Uh, when he was with the Tigers, I thought that was perfect for him. He had all those power guys. Still couldn't get nothing done, but he's done a great job there. Going with the Mets to win it, and then the NBA. The NBA starts. I well tomorrow night. 27th. I thought it started tonight at the 26th. I thought I saw, I saw a commercial on ESPN promoting October 26th, but apparently not. You got the Pistons at the Hawks, 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, they actually have a spread on basketball. I feel like that's weird. Seven points to the Hawks. Then on TNT, you have a doubleheader with the Cavaliers at the Chicago Bulls at 7 p.m. And then at t- excuse me, 9.30 p.m., Central Time. You'll have the New Orleans Pelicans taking on the NBA champs, the Golden State Warriors. Going to be some good games for uh, the NBA. And I want y'all to check out my roster here for the NBA basketball, ESPN Fantasy Basketball. I I did this at midnight. Uh, I had it. I did it with some of my co or one of my coworkers from uh, Seattle when I was up there. He invited me. It's ten o'clock over there. 12 o'clock over here when I did it, and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'll I'm, still do it. So here's my team. I haven't messed uh, with anything just yet um, with the rosters or anything, but here it is. I got Kimball Walker, James Harden, Carmelo Anthony, LaMarcus Aldridge, Tim Duncan, uh, Kentavious Caldwell-Pope, Kevin Love, Danny Green, Al Jefferson, Trevor Ariza, Roy Hibbert, Trey Burke, and Evan Turner as my team right now. And we're doing this in categories. So, you know, some of the guys like Duncan, he doesn't score a whole lot of points, but he gets, uh, you know, rebounds and a little bit of assist. So I had to separate it, you know, through that. I think I did a great job. I'm trying to get Roy Hibbert. I'm trying to trade Roy Hibbert for Jamil Okafor, uh, Jaheel Okafor. I won him. I didn't draft Okafor because I thought he was uh, – I thought he was hurt. I thought he was the one that was out for the year. I may have got confused. Uh, I thought he was out for the year. He's not. But whatever. So I'm trying to get him back. 
But anyways, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. If you did, be sure to hit that like button. Share it with your friends and family. Give it a five-star rating on iTunes. And, uh, again, follow me on Twitter, at short underscore sports 24-7. And as always, guys, God first, God bless. I will see you guys Friday morning. And as always, I'm out. Peace.